If you play fantasy baseball, you know how important it is to be active on the waiver wire all season long. Now that we're a week into the season, it's time to make moves. I'm going to give you the names of 10 players who could help you right now in 10 minutes or less. So as we head to week two of the fantasy season, right now, the number one player is Brian Anderson. Not kidding, y'all. Brian Anderson, now with Milwaukee after escaping the Marlins franchise. Maybe that's all it took. He's gotten at least one hit in every game so far, batting a cool 500, three homers, and 10 RBIs. Coming through spring training, we weren't even sure if Anderson was going to be an everyday player. Milwaukee has been hot, and Anderson, of course, the hottest of them all. This is a guy who was a pretty high-end prospect coming up. His numbers just kind of slowly faded year after year, though, in Miami. Just every season, a few points lower in the batting average. And the last two seasons, just so many injuries. It seemed like he was destined to just be a bench player at best. Well, maybe the change of scenery, maybe full health, who knows what it is. But at age 29, he's having so far a career year. You don't necessarily want to fully buy into it. But at this point, it would not hurt to pick him up if he's still available. And you know we have to talk Rays. Tampa Bay cannot be beat yet. There are a few players worth considering there. But the one that just for some reason isn't getting enough traction. And I mentioned on my all sleeper team, if you check that video out, you know that I am big on Jose Siri. Well, he's hit safely in all six games so far. He's showing that power speed combo that makes him so alluring. Already two home runs, eight RBIs and a steal. I think the stolen bases will come a lot more. Hits pretty low in the lineup, sometimes last, and you know Tampa does like to mix and match, but the fact that he is playing most days, he's not being platooned in any way, makes me feel better. And, well, the strikeouts are still there, but his average is pretty good. He might go through a slump eventually, but right now, I want to keep him in my lineup if I can. And then you know if you want speed, you've got to pick it up quick because it won't be long before your opponents do. If you're in a rotor league where stolen bases are a category, you need to jump on Miles Straw. Now, Straw was among the league leaders two years ago with 30 steals, scored 86 runs as well. But then last year, big step back. The average is down to 221 and barely got over 20 steals. Bounce back is what he has done. He already has five steals and is hitting 360. Small sample, but we've seen him do it before. And so at this point, pick him back up. Let's just write last year off as a down season. Same thing goes for Jorge Mateo in Baltimore. Five steals, hitting 350. And he will not stop running. Start out with four steals in the first two games of the season. Just stole another base tonight. This is a guy who's going to continue to run. Was also among the stolen base leaders last year. The reason he wasn't drafted everywhere and is available so freely on waivers still is because all this young talent that Baltimore has, it wasn't a sure thing that he was going to be a regular player. You know, Gunnar Henderson now stepping in at third base. And Mateo might have got squeezed out because... Well, batting average is pretty iffy with him sometimes. But he's a regular, he's hitting well, and he should be picking up right where he left off last year. And then if you're looking for a stash, a guy who could make some noise, but maybe not quite yet, Francisco Alvarez of the Mets. One of the biggest prospects in the minors and at catcher, super valuable for fantasy if he gets regular at bats. That's the question right now. Well, Omar Narvaez is on the shelf for about eight to 10 weeks, and that's where the door opens. He's already been called up. Thomas Nito got that first start behind the plate. Alvarez sat. I think he's going to get his shot. The problem is that even if he does start playing, he doesn't even qualify as a catcher in most formats. He's got DH only eligibility because he did play more games at DH last year when he came up. It shouldn't take long. If Alvarez gets a week's worth of playing time, he'll slot in there. Who knows? Potential rookie of the year candidate if everything breaks right. But again, the fact that he's still kind of raw, the plate discipline remains to be seen at the major league level, and the Mets probably won't wait around if he slumps. Nito could be the guy who's just that safe veteran fallback. So high risk, high reward. I'm going to go for the reward. I'm going to take a chance and stash him wherever I can. Now on the pitching side, I'm going to start with a guy that I was going to wait and see what happened tonight because I love Mackenzie Gore. Been talking about him all preseason, one of my favorite draft sleepers. And a guy I can't believe more people aren't on because 
just, yeah, he had some injuries late last season, a couple of bumpy starts. But do we remember how great he was the first half? The fact that he was the top pitching prospect in all of baseball not long ago, and we're just giving up on him because he's in Washington. First start was good, and then this start, I have to admit, I kept him on the bench in some of my leagues because it was at Coors Field, and you never know how that goes. Well, it went just fine. In Colorado, allowed only two runs over six innings, struck out six. He did that in the first outing as well and only gave up one run in that first outing. So back-to-back -back quality starts. And now he's going to get a little bit of an easier schedule going forward. So Mackenzie Gore has all the stuff. We know this. If he is off to this good a start already, I'm adding him in any leagues. I don't already have him. Another guy I was really big on in the preseason and drafted as much as I could was Justin Steele in Chicago. We'll wait and see what happens because as I speak right now, he's scheduled to start tomorrow against Texas. I really like that Rangers offense. I'm a little worried, but still in general, I'm not worried about. He was lights out in his first outing, scoreless over six innings and struck out eight. I think he's going to strike out more than a batter per inning all season long. This is a guy who is really still flying under the radar. So scoop him up, even if he does get roughed up, which I don't expect. But I think that he's going to be a solid starter, mid-rotation guy in fantasy lineups everywhere by year's end. And then one more of my guys, someone who was a deep sleeper that I mentioned for drafts, Kyle Muller in Oakland. The numbers for his brief career in the majors, not pretty, but... This is a young pitcher, a guy who's got the talent, just needs the right situation. Well, I think pitching in Oakland is a great situation because that is a very favorable pitching environment, and he's definitely going to get a chance to stay in that rotation. Hell, he was the opening day starter, if that tells you anything about the state of the athletics these days. Well, he did really well on opening day, and then he did it again in his second start. Not striking out a ton of guys, but he only gave up a run and four hits to the Angels, and then just two runs on four hits to Cleveland. These weren't a pair of pushovers. Despite the fact he's a big 6'7 lefty, he's not the next Randy Johnson, not blowing anybody away with the heat. Sits about 93 on his fastball these days, but he has high fastball spin, one of the best in the majors, and his changeup looks to be improved from last year. I think the Ks will come. But look, this is a guy that looks like he will keep those ratios nice and low for you if he keeps pitching the way he is. Then there's a pitcher that everybody seems to have forgotten about, Tyler McGill for the Mets. With the injuries in that rotation, he's had a chance to step in and has been great. Two wins and two tries, 10 strikeouts in 11 innings. If we remember McGill and the chances he got last year before injury was really effective. A lot of people are excited about him and then we tend to just kind of forget because of time. Well, he's looking really good. I was kind of interested in David Peterson knowing that he was gonna go in the rotation, but now that McGill is in there as well and he seems to be even more effective, he's got, I think, has a higher ceiling than David Peterson. And then the closer carousel hasn't started spinning just yet, but here's a name that is still available, Pierce Johnson for the Rockies. As long as Daniel Bard is out, looks like Johnson is the guy who's getting the chances so far so good because he's converted both, got two saves already, and he struck out seven batters over three innings. Johnson, just a two-pitch pitcher, which is fine for a closer. Obviously, you're always going to have that concern with a pitcher in Colorado. Well, look, saves come on any team in any park. Johnson's the guy right now. You need saves. You want a closer. Pick him up if he's out there. It might be a little worrisome for the guy who didn't have any saves coming into this year. And given the team that he's on, you might worry, is this a temporary thing? But look, just because he hasn't been given that chance yet, doesn't mean he can't run away with it. Every year we see closers pop out of nowhere. And if he's the guy and he's effective, trust it. Those players are making the impact right now. And you should be checking on waivers. What about those prospects who could be ready to make an impact soon? Check out my rookie and prospect report for this week.